Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Alex Roberts from the Observatory of Public Sector Innovation and thank you very much for joining us today to talk about our new innovation primer being launched on rules as code. Um, today we have a couple of things to note. Firstly, uh, please, as usual, ask your questions on the Q&A function. Um, we are recording this and it will be made available on our YouTube account in the next uh, day or so. And the link to that will be added to the blog, which you'll all receive a link to. Um, just for those who are not familiar with us, uh, the Observatory of Public Sector Innovation was set up a number of years to do three main things, helping governments uncover what's next and think through the implications of that helping turn the new into the normal and embedding it into core practice and acting as a source of trust and advice for governments on taking a more deliberate, consistent and reliable approach to public sector innovation. Today's event is under that umbrella of uncovering what's next, seeing how the, the issue of rules as code might provide a, uh, an, a window into a different way of working for the public sector. The report, Cracking the Code, Rulemaking for Humans and Machines, is available on our site and we have it in English and French. Uh, today, just quickly, we'll have an introduction and opening remarks from uh, Janusz Bertok, the Deputy uh, Director of the Public Governance Directorate here at the OECD, and Matty Schneider, the Chief Innovation Officer for Ambassador Verdier, who unfortunately was pulled away at the last minute. Uh, my colleague James will give an overview of the primer content and then we'll dive into a, a panel discussion with Pia Andrews and uh, Malco from the French administration and then some Q&A. Um, but firstly, I'd like to hand over to Janosch to provide us uh, with some opening remarks. Thank you, Janosch. Thank you, Alex. Uh, merci beaucoup. Soyez le bienvenu. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today for this uh, launching event uh, and around the world. We have no more than 60 participants and we expect more. And this is really a great pleasure to join this launch of this new premier of the OECD uh, Observatory of Public Sector Innovation, the Cracking the Code, Rulemaking for Humans and Machine en Francais, Déchiffrer le Code, Élaboration des Règles Exécutant par les Humains et par les Machines. This is really an exciting piece, and this is not the first one. This is actually the, 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 the 42nd of uh, the working papers on public governance. And this is really a tradition to provide you with trusted advice on emerging trends in public sector and in management. This is also the third OPSI series, and uh, this is the what next OPSI series in public sector innovation to present emerging issues, concepts, new approaches and trends. And this is exactly what this, uh, uh, this uh, working uh, paper, the rules as code represents. This is a new exciting concept. This is rethinking one of the core functions of government and the state, which is rulemaking. And uh, rules, as codes involves the creation of an official version of rules in a machine consumable form. So this goes beyond the traditional communication to humans and the natural language version, because this rules as code allows rules to be understood and action by computer system in a consistent way. So this is a very innovative new idea, new concept, and we are looking forward to learning the experiences from various jurisdictions. What strikes me most about this uh, rules as code, that this is not only a technocratic solution. And uh, as the premier explores, if it's adopted by governments at a scale, rules as code could significantly change how governments they create, diffuse and enforce rules. And how we could actually improve the compliance with the rules. And, uh, and as example, uh, uh, rules as code could really enable greater ex ante policy modeling by governments, but also making more easier for people to understand their rights and obligations. So in the current context of the COVID-19 crisis, when we experience 
extreme uncertainty, but also accelerated of many of the, the these are the ongoing trends like the rapid digital transformation. This new ambitious ideas such as the rules as code are certainly, this is at the heart of the public debate. So we understand rules as a code is in an early stage as a concept. And there are a lot of uh, remains to test and improve, but we are very much confident that this premier will mobilize diverse range of actors from government, from the public sector, and also from academia in order to continue this progress and work on these things and advance this exciting uh, concept. Of course, we will also uh, engage leaders and experts because we need this input from innovators to develop and also integrate these ideas into established public sector processes. So in this occasion, I would like to really thank uh, or distinguish the speakers and the innovators, the lead innovators, in order to join and help us launching this debate today. And um, particularly, I thank uh, uh, Matti Schneider for uh, the chief uh, information officer for joining and uh, uh, representing Henri Verdier, the ambassador to the Numérique in France, and also uh, Pia Andrew, the digital lead and special advisor at Service Canada, and uh, Moko Kiroka, the government whisperer from Peter Group France. So merci beaucoup and thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to learning about your insights and uh, sharing your experience and this is what we greatly appreciate. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Janosch. And now we'll turn to Matti Schneider, Chief Innovation Officer to the Ambassador for Digital Affairs. And apology, Matti, my uh, Google skills weren't quite quick enough to get your photo up there. But thank you for joining. Thank you very much. Thank you, Janosch. Thank you, Alex. And uh, no, uh, no worries for this missing face. Um, I am indeed today uh, here as the Chief Innovation Officer to uh, French Ambassador for Digital Affairs, Henri Verdier, but I'm also uh, lucky enough to have accompanied most of, of the uh, work on, on what is now called Better Rules, at least from France, uh, but uh, since, since 2014, and also to have acted partly as a bridge with uh, New Zealand, uh, which, as outlined in the report, is, is the other um, uh, area in which uh, I believe rules as code have, have uh, really emerged. Um, and I hope to share uh, in these introductory remarks uh, parts of, um, of what I've, I've been able to, to uh, see and learn there. Um, it's, it's quite amusing that, that these two areas, France and New Zealand, are at the antipodes of the globe because they've also embodied uh, two different ways of, of uh, uh, pushing for this innovation that is now called rules as code. Um, in France, we, we really started um, as, a, as a concrete experience uh, by, by building a piece of software, uh, which is now called Open Fisca, and which I will, I will tell more in, in just a moment. But, and uh, in New Zealand, this same uh, intention for innovation came more from a theoretical stand ground um, in terms of the Better Rules Report, which outlined many things that were not fully understood in France at the time, while New Zealand was missing some of the implementation. And as most uh, of you who uh, might have worked in digital transformation, it is really the junction between top-down innovation and bottom-up and bottom innovation that managed to actually deliver any sort of transformation. And I believe that we are now in this moment for better rules where both these movements actually align. And this report, which is excellent in my, in my view, as it outlines both the intentions, the constraints, but also the reality and at the current context really show. So maybe one thing that kind of amused me in, in the report um, was how rules as code was, was presented as something that was deliberate. It is true uh, that the intention is deliberate, but it is true um, when walking the path. Um, one should not misunderstand the, um, deli the deliberate intention as, 
as a great plan. We, we have been uh, slowly learning and evolving over time. Now, I hope that um, new initiatives might be more deliberate based on, on this report. Um, but let me tell you uh, a, a bit more about the, the French experience and, and you would be able to judge um, how, how deliberate this whole intention was. So in, in France, the, the, this, um, this path was, uh, was opened uh, by agents of, of the Treasury, um, of the Ministry of Finance uh, in 2011, 2012, uh, who desperately needed uh, some uh, software for simulation in order to better understand the impact of, of potential uh, changes in law. And this is not something that is exceptional. However, what was exceptional was the strong um, intention, and there is here, there here was, was deliberate action for open sourcing this work, for making it available for everyone without, uh, without any expectation on, on what it could be used for. Um, and that was the deliberate attention of, of uh, Henri Verdier, who is now uh, ambassador, who in 2013, at the head of ETALAB, uh, the Open Data Task Force, um, and with the intention of government as a platform, open sourced this piece of software, which created the basis from a, sim from a simulation software for um, tools that would be uh, delivered directly to citizens, enabling them to better understand their rights, their entitlements, for example, to benefits, but also uh, their obligations for paying specific taxes. So from a piece of simulation software, the open sourcing, the deliberate intention of making it available for other uses was first reused by the public sector with a different intention, enabling people and companies to directly understand better the rules that already applied to them. Um, and thanks to the products that were built, the digital services that were provided based on, on, on this um, um, engine, new contributors joined, first from the French administration, who contributed some of the rules that they were responsible for. But soon we also had NGOs and private companies who started implementing additional rules and improving the overall uh, system. We had researchers writing theses based on, on the models that we uh, created all together. We had um, associations and civil society using the results for lobbying for some changes in law. So this whole system was useful because it had concrete uses. It was not the fantasy of having rules that could be read by machines, but it was really driven by use cases that this flourished. Um, of course, we had other benefits, such as being able to uh, outline gray areas in, in legislation. But without the products that made these, uh, these rules and this code uh, reusable for others, we would have had no systemic impact. Um, I guess that one of the challenge that we had at the time, and that is still very much uh, active, which is also an opportunity, is the feedback loop. That is, how do you make law, do you make rules evolve based on the model, on what it has outlined? And I believe that this is what New Zealand understood uh, from, from the start and had theorized at first without even having fully written rules as code at the time. Um, but the, um, this, this intention is now very clear. We also have now it better understood in France, and uh, I believe Mauko Quiroga will um, talk a bit more about Lex Impact uh, and other tools that, um, that we are considering uh, that are about making more readable and predictable uh, the potential impact of changes, which is made extremely simple once you have a fully usable model of your rules as code. Um, actually, being now in this moment where we call this thing rules as code, which in France we used to call transformer la loi en code, 
uh, transform law into code and better rules. Um, at some time, um, we used to call that government as a platform. That was the intention. Uh, we hoped that uh, government could be an enabler for more innovation, for uh, impactful social changes. And well, maybe uh, better rules, uh, sorry, maybe rules as code is one of the pieces of this government as a platform that has never been fully implemented. But now that might be our best opportunity for, uh, for uh, building it and, and enabling it. And the main challenge that is uh, now in, in, the, um, in the path of, of um, rules as code is probably the same challenge that we are facing in any sort of digital transformation. That is the legitimacy of building interdisciplinary teams. Um, how could you make rules as code without uh, putting on the same, at the same table uh, drafters and coders? Well, this is the kind of issue that would, you would encounter in any sort of fundamental transformation. It is needed and it is where we still have the most work to do. That is convincing in government and outside government that we need to work together beyond silos in order to deliver better digital public services. And rules as code is one of the most promising areas for this sort of transformation, but we first need to make sure that everyone is included within and outside of government. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maddie. And Maddie represents what we at the OECD uh, love, which is that learning from international experiences, uh, both from seeing other people's practices, but also going and actually working on them. Um, I'm now going to pass to uh, my colleague James, who really uh, led the push on this piece of work and helped uh, draft and, and write this. Um, so uh, who will give us some of the, the key sort of findings and elements uh, in the much longer report, um, but that we do have a highlights version of too. James, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Alex, and good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from today. And I'd just like to extend my thanks again to um, all our guests for joining us uh, this morning. It's great to, to have you here and also to all the attendees online today. Um, so I'm James Moen. Um, I work part-time at OPSI uh, while I'm also studying my master's in public policy at Sciences Po. And I co-authored the report, as Alex uh, mentioned. Um, today I'm going to speak uh, just very briefly about the primer and its content and specifically I'm going to talk about three things. Uh, the first is um, how we actually arrived here. Uh, the second is some of the aspects of what the primer includes and the third is what we're really aiming for in the primer as well as um, I guess what we hope it will achieve. So how did we uh, get here? Well, as mentioned, uh, this primer is the third in a series produced by OPSI with the previous two being on, on blockchain and AI. And the primer is really designed to uh, give a, a clear and understandable introduction uh, to an emerging technology or approach uh, that's becoming uh, relevant or is relevant already in the public uh, service. And in terms of rules as code specifically, our involvement uh, goes back to the 2019 uh, Global Trends Report, uh, which OPSI produces every year and which looks at trends um, in public sector innovation occurring around the world. And as has already been uh, mentioned, uh, this uh, report looked at the trend towards a machine uh, readable world and particularly the Better Rules Initiative that came out of New Zealand that was um, that Pierre and Maddie were, were involved in. Um, and this was an initiative that I think really um, brought global attention and focus, um, I guess, to rules as code. And so at the end of last year, uh, we decided to um, uh, work on a full innovation primer that explored this in greater detail. And Alex and I have benefited from speaking to a huge number of uh, technologists, uh, legislative drafters, public servants uh, from all around the world. Um, who have really helped us um, shape uh, what's included in this. 
And, and also through the, the public consultation that we ran on the primer, um, we're very appreciative to everyone who contributed to that because we think it's, it's really strengthened the, the final arguments. Um, of course, uh, our big challenge was what to include. So for those of you who have already seen the draft, uh, you will know that it's quite extensive, which is why we've also produced a highlights document. But broadly, um, it covers uh, seven key areas. And so chapter one deals with the new context uh, for uh, the government's operating in and why this means uh, potentially new rules, but also new rulemaking processes are required. Chapters two and three look at um, the rules as code concept, what it is and why it's important and why it may be uh, needed for governments. While chapters four and five look at the case for rules as code, as well as uh, then the benefits and then uh, approaches and considerations that need to be taken into account um, when, when thinking about initiatives in this area. Finally, chapter seven uh, looks at a number of future scenarios that we hope will help explore how rules as code could play out at a more macro level. And chapter eight provides um, insights into how rules as code can be operationalized in a public sector context. I'm not going to go through all these in detail, but I do want to hit upon three things that I think are really uh, quite important. Let's see if we can, yeah. Um, so the first is on definition, and we really explore two ways in which uh, rules as code has been conceptualized. And one is as an output, and one is as an approach. And so as an output, uh, we've considered that rules as code um, is a, refers to a coded version of rules that can be understood and used by computers. And I think important here is to recognize that coded rules already exist today. So businesses, individuals, governments already create coded rules um, based on, on the natural language versions provided by governments to inform a whole range of business systems. And here, for example, you can think about how a, um, a tax, an online tax return platform works. Secondly, however, and perhaps uh, more importantly though, is that we also explore rules as code as an approach. Uh, one that we have characterized, as Maddie said, as uh, strategic, deliberate, and systemic. And in this, uh, we mean that rules as, a code, rules as code as an approach is one that conceives and creates machine consumable rules from the outset of their creation. And I think this is really important because as we note in the report, this is the version of rules as code that we think changes the when, how, why, how and for whom uh, rules is made and, and, and those dimensions. Secondly, um, I just want to talk about that we've tried to balance um, the theoretical in, and with the practical in the report. So the primer definitely explores rules as code um, in terms of what it is, um, its, its, its history. So for example, we locate it within the movement from e-government to um, digital government to government as a platform, as, as again has been mentioned. And, um, but we also provide a number of case studies and practical um, advice to um, those individual public servants who are just getting familiar with this and looking to um, apply it in their own context. And uh, particularly, I just wanted to, to mention again, I think here France has really um, been instructive in this regard. So not only have they uh, created um, those applications that allow individuals to assess their, their entitlements for government support on the basis of coded rules. They're also really pushing ahead um, this capability of ex ante policy modeling. And I think this is a, a perfect example of one of the uh, really interesting and important things that uh, rules as code could potentially help enable in the future. And finally, um, I just want to say that rules as code um, is an emerging um, an exciting area, but one that is certainly still emerging. So Alex and I are probably quite sure that uh, we may not have everything 100% right. Uh, we, we know that more will emerge. We know that things will change and develop. However, I guess uh, what we feel confident in is that um, we have provided, I guess, a, a good basis for, for this work to continue and, and, a, and a, hopefully a point of reference for, for future efforts in the space. And I think I can illustrate this um, through one particularly important piece of content, uh, content. 
and that's through the principles that we provide. So, so in the um, in the primer, we look at three uh, look at a number of principles, including uh, transparency, traceability, accountability, um, appropriateness, and security. And these we think um, uh, they've been sourced from across the rules as code um, community across the world. And we think that they uh, can form the basis um, of initiatives, of future initiatives that will help rules as code um, efforts become a success and also help us source uh, some of those concerns that are typically raised in, in conjunction with this idea. But the point I, I wanna make here is that these are not set in stone and, and we hope uh, certainly that as uh, more rules as code initiatives uh, develop across the world, that these will be developed and added to and strengthened um, as time go, goes on. And I guess uh, this segues nicely into what we're aiming for with the primer. So we really wanted to provide something uh, that we hope is clear and understandable um, and provides that, that strong introduction to, to the area. We wanted it to be robust, so the primer uh, canvases a number of um, opinions and arguments from um, both academic and non-academic and applied um, histories. So, um, to inform, I guess the third the third aim, which is that we wanted it to be actionable. And I think this is this is what I'll finish on. We want uh, the primer to um, move the conversation around rules as code forward. We hope that it will uh, contribute to um, the development of the concept in the future. And we hope that uh, Rules as Code will, I guess, um, reach uh, its potential that we, we think it has. And I guess to discuss this in further, I'll, I'll hand back to Alex uh, and Pia and Marco. Thank you. Thank you, James. Um, so why rules as code and where to next? Well, we've heard a, a little bit from the, the French experience. So now I'm going to ask our, our guests to reflect upon uh, why they see this as an important shift in public administration and how we might get there and, and how uh, the, the work of the, this primer and the examples pointed into it um, point the way. Uh, I'm really pleased we've got these two uh, on the panel today. Uh, Pia, I've known for a very long time and has been a, an important champion of better public administration through the use of better, better use of technology for a long time. And Malco uh, has been a very impressive contributor to the field here in France as well. Um, I might start with you, Pia, uh, given um, you you were really the, the 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 person who helped us pick up on this topic. Uh, it was that example from New Zealand that really helped us see that that this was a, a thing. Um, perhaps as as usual, the Anglo's are better at, at selling uh, <laughs> these concepts than some other countries. Um, and you really helped coin that rules as code uh, phrase, which I think has been an important uh, means of of getting this big sort of hard to get to grips to uh, with concepts, but making it something uh, point, something that we can really help see why it's so important. So Pia, what, what would you like to, to share about Rules as Code and the journey so far? Um, thank you so much. Um, so what I might do, first of all, thank you so much for having me and, um, and for that little um, uh, acknowledgement. I really appreciate that. Um, I, um, uh, and, and huge congratulations on the primer. I do think it's a, a really great read and I do recommend it to everyone and think it will help uh, drive broader understanding of the opportunity. I thought I'd share just a few minutes, about five minutes of um, some thoughts I thought would be helpful for this conversation. Um, the first thing is for my part, how I got involved in this is I think a, a helpful bit of background. Um, and it's only, I started this after um, Matty and, and, and the French experience. Um, I was working actually in a regulator uh, in a financial intelligence and regulatory agency in 2016. And I had been involved in digital government initiatives for quite some time prior to that. But working in the regulator was the first time I really saw the, um, the, the major issues of translation gap between what's written in legislation and what's uh, done on the ground. And uh, we started experimenting with um, the idea of, I guess, legislation as code. 
Um, and it was really interesting because even just taking the prescriptive rules, we had um, banks say to us, if, we, if they had the prescriptive rules of the anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing um, uh, regulatory regime available from government authoritatively as an API they could consume, it would save them 16, like individual banks, $16 million a year. And it, it really sort of blew open this, this um, huge opportunity in the regulatory sector around um, the fact that um, regulators are using decrease, are getting decreasing and decreasing amounts of resources to go after a exponentially increasing um, regulated landscape. And, uh, and so all that's happening is a lot of money is being invested in risk modeling to figure out which segment of the regulated entities you should investigate. But actually rules as code and legislation as code, regulation as code, opens up the opportunity to do automated monitoring, automated um, patent analysis, uh, automated um, intelligence around um, the impact and effectiveness of um, regulation and policies. So that was the starting point for, for me and the team that I was working with then. And then that sort of led to uh, moving to New Zealand and doing work there. Um, I, I wanted to share um, just a couple of, of concepts. Um, the key opportunities and challenges that, um, that uh, legislation and regulation as code uh, really opens for us fundamentally come down to, and I'll just uh, share just a couple of slides. Uh, my apologies, I promise to not do death by PowerPoint, but. I wanted to share these ideas, these concepts. Uh, so first of all, we need better rules. <laughs> there's a lot of just, there's a lot of rules, uh, a lot of legislation, regulation that was drafted um, in some countries hundreds of years ago um, that should be more easy to implement, should be easier to model. In New Zealand, we did an experiment very early on with a, a very simple piece of legislation that was implemented so so incorrectly and so um, inconsistently across the domain, it led to um, quite substantial issues, and that's common. We found um, actual rules around uh, entitlement that had been misinterpreted through a spreadsheet someone made that um, you know uh, rounded a number down halfway through a calculation that was then mispaying people. This is common. Uh, there is a massive translation gap for better regulatory, better service outcomes. Um, and it is a huge cost um, to actually implement uh, legislation and policy because we keep using lawyers as modems. <laughs> it's, um, that was a very uh, pithy um, way to phrase it uh, that we started talking about a few years back, but it's true. When we are uh, translating between an analog format and a digital format, we are effectively using lawyers as very expensive and quite variable um, modems and that is uh, not particularly effective. Um, so we need to have actually better rules that are reformed holistically, are more easy to implement um, and that are easy to interpret in a consistent way. We need to adapt to digital new paradigms. Um, a lot of policy groups um, take a long time to develop policy and they just have the policy people in the room. Um, uh, quite often they don't even have the policy and legislators in the same room together. <laughs> um, and then let alone service designers or techies or end users um, or data folk in the room you end up with, uh, in a lot of cases, rules that um, may not um, suit the purpose. So I remember being at a regulators event and, um, and one person got up and was talking about a particular piece of regulation and they said it was a perfect, perfect regulation. It was just the techies that, that uh, screwed it up. And I got up and said, well, as one of your besmirched techies, uh, in this particular case, the regulation was around heart monitors. Um, and um, what they had enabled uh, was um, open Wi-Fi on, on internal devices like heart monitors and um, insulin um, injectors. And uh, we pointed out if you'd had anyone with even an iota of technical knowledge in the room, they would have pointed out that open Wi-Fi on a heart monitor is probably a bad idea. And of course, what turned out is people could actually connect to your heart monitor, to your pacemaker and actually stop a person's heart. So for a modern and highly complex world, we need to have multidisciplinary people in the room so that we can test and throw around and actually implement in a very rapid um, and agile and test driven way, new policies so that we can ensure and, and have high confidence in the impact and policy intent being realized through the implementation of those new policies and, and legislation and regulation. Thirdly, and this one scares the pants of a lot of people, uh, excuse the colloquialism, but 
<laughs> shaping society and economy is not just about shaping human behavior anymore. There is a lot of actors, um, machines are actually users as well. There's a lot of actors that we need to regulate that are actually not people. So the old idea of, well, if a person agrees with this principle, then we can, you know, and they do the wrong thing, then we can identify that and then go and hold them accountable. But if it's a machine, strangely enough, machines are not responsive to legal, financial or criminal pressures. So um, really making sure that we actually start to assume that machines are users of our rules, are users of our regulation and legislation will help us not just ensure the right outcomes, but will help us actually uh, design new security paradigms, new monitoring paradigms and new intervention paradigms uh, that are suitable for the 21st century. The final real question that, that this whole area starts to answer is, is how we can actually design better futures. Um, because if we keep creating legacy rules for a legacy world, and yet we're in a very fast paced digital world, then we're gonna end up with uh, policies and rules that are at best ineffective and at worst disastrous. COVID has, um, has demonstrated and has extrapolated and compounded major uh, areas of inequity and inequality. And, um, that, um, and a lot of the policy responses were, um, um, were somewhat effective, but uh, in some cases were completely ineffective. Major groups were missing across the world um, and continue to be missing. We need policy to be able to be rapid and iterative and test driven so that we can ensure that we can respond quickly, very quickly with confidence. If we make a policy change, we need to know the impact of that change across the whole of the regulatory system and the legislative system, not just the impact within a, a policy silo or, a, um, or in an academic way. We need to be able to test these things in reality to have that confidence. So a couple of quick further things, the current state of rules as code, to some degree, rules as code or codifying rules is old as the hills because everyone has to codify rules into tech. But getting rules as code um, is um, in, a, in a authoritative way is really where the huge shift here is. So the current status is people take rules in legislation and policy, you get lots of interpretations, you get lots of implementations. You end up uh, having limited reuse, conflicting interpretations, and you don't have any assurance <laughs> of how those rules have been used. So the future state is, you're actually co-drafting the policy intent, the concept model, the logic flow, the, the policy. You then co-draft human and machine readable rules simultaneously. It gives you a chance to both get a better human draft uh, and in some countries that's, you know, bilingual already. So adding a coded version is just a third or fourth language. Um, but you can then also test it in reality. You could actually then at the point where the human version is enacted in Parliament, have that um, available as an API straight away. So actual API of legislation. The key thing here is that you then end up getting reuse and the huge new benefits end up um, higher confidence, um, better automation, better testing, and a lot of this France is certainly leading the world in, um, in showing how some of this can be done and uh, the work that's been done in New Zealand and frankly also in the last couple of years in Canada uh, has um, really been striving to catch up with that as well. But it keep, creates the opportunity for monitoring of patterns of usage. Um, you may not make the government version of the rules mandated, but um, it, it would be an interesting pattern to say, well, who's choosing to not use them and why? Um, uh, can we see any patterns of how it's being used? Can we actually uh, see if there's an unusual spike um, that we didn't expect? You can start to actually do some very clever things. Um, but this isn't just about rules as code, this is about policy transformation. This is the key. <laughs> this is almost as important as um, rules as code, um, arguably more important. The traditional policy cycle is linear. It's drawn like a circle, but it's you know remarkably linear. Um, and it's not iterative, it's not test driven, it's not um, MVP driven, <laughs> uh, it's not co-designed. Uh, so really shifting how we do policy to be more about identifying opportunities, learning, ideating, prototyping, testing, and continuing to do that over and over with different people in the room, with the multidisciplinary team, so that then you only scale and you only implement new policies after you know they work, not just based on um, academic modeling, not just based on um, hopes. <laughs> so um, the final quick thing I'll say is that this area is really debunking a major myth that I think took the world by storm a few decades ago. 
there was a real shift away from prescriptive uh, policy to principles-based policy. And in some respects that's been helpful, but in some cases it's created um, massive issues. So this is about just trying to get balance back to how we do our, our drafting. Where you want clear, well-articulated and um, consistent implementation um, prescriptive or, or clear implementation rules are really, really helpful. Where you want to have interpretation, maintain interpretation. But I think uh, the whole world sort of went all principles or all prescriptive. And the fact is that neither are fit for purpose for all circumstances. And, um, and we need to and must ensure that we have uh, clear um, prescriptive rules where we do want to have consistency of implementation. And the more machine consumable things are, the more that we'll get that uh, clarity. Why? Because AI is not just coming, it's here, it's well here. And uh, if we don't have those clarity of rules, then uh, AI will continue to interpret it according to its own um, internal logic. And, um, and if we don't codify, for instance, that we value humans more than money, then um, money will naturally be valued more than humans uh, in this new world. So figuring out what we each do best, figuring out how humans and machines can work together is not about automating the workforce is not about rules as code or anything else. Um, replacing the need for a effective, strong, empathetic, uh, values driven and empathetic uh, and effective and engaged public sector. It's about how we can actually have a augmented public sector that can respond to the 21st century ex exponentialism of, of challenges um, and, um, and speed of change. And, uh, and then actually get to a point where we can be government as a platform, not just with, um, with tools, but um, by providing the right uh, social, financial and, um, and, uh, and values based um, basis upon which uh, our entire society and all the citizens within it can thrive. So thank you very much for, for your, um, I hope that was helpful comments and I'm just absolutely delighted to see the whole world really um, um, exploring for themselves the opportunities of uh, rules as code, legislation as code, and indeed the necessity for policy transformation uh, so that uh, we can be fit for purpose in the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pia. Uh, now, Malco, I'd like to turn to you. Uh, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself and giving a little bit of the, your, your journey on, on this rules as code experience, but I'd also like you to, to uh, start addressing one of the questions and one of the common uh, concerns around rules as code is that uh, that battle between legislative intent and flexibility, that there needs to be room to, to move when you're interpreting rules because law by nature, by definition, really can't encompass every considerable conceivable situation. I mean, that is the nature of law is that it evolves. Uh, so, Malco, perhaps I can pass to you to, to introduce yourself and, and tackle that question as well, if you might, wouldn't mind. Thanks. Um, so, thank you for, for having me today. Um, my, my, my journey uh, on Russo's Codes is really tied up with, uh, with Matty's one and Henry's one as well. So, uh, what happens is that um, uh, at some point, I wanted to apply for a visa in France and I couldn't because they were asking me for a paper that was not written anywhere. <laughs> uh, and so, so that, got, that got me really, 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 really angry. And, and, and that's how I started looking a little bit on specifically on, on going as a platform and how we can actually uh, get to, 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 to profit from the intelligence of uh, the citizenship within government. And that's how I met Mati, who actually got me uh, uh, well, they basically that ended up me working in this work, work, workforce uh, where we try to deliver better public services called BetaGov. And that's how I get to know uh, Open Fisk as well. And so from there, what happens is that I, I saw uh, three things that have already, already been uh, uh, mentioned, but I think it's really interesting. So. Uh, there are three things that I saw that, 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 that um, they told me, I mean, we could do better. The first one is experience Matthew was working on the time, which was the, the actual uh, known take up of uh, social benefits. So what we're saying is that it was really complicated to, for people to get to know what the social benefits were and if they were eligible or not, but mostly, most importantly, how to access to them. So things were super complicated and there was a creating a public policy problem both in terms of people not accessing to them 
and second, a huge uh, pressure on civil servants. Uh, so at the time, what we saw, I, I, I didn't, I was not thinking about rules as code, but it was interesting to know that if we can get all these public administrations and all these uh, researchers and citizens working together in the different social benefits in just one single platform, it would be easier for government to, to come up with reforms to simplify the access to those um, to those social benefits. And, and most importantly, and the thing about interpretation is that, uh, as you say, at some point, there are a lot of prescriptive rules, especially in, in, in pu public policy and public law, that you can actually reduce to something that could be applied by a machine. Um, but th there are cases that are really complicated. There are cases that will always require uh, the discretion, uh, specifically of the people working, the civil service, the street level servants working over there. And, and so one thing that I learned about that experience and others uh, that we built at, at the time and with Betsigo is that you don't aim to automatize everything and you are not uh, willing to disintermediate everything because your objective is not to automatize. It's not like a technocratic fantasy. What we're aiming for is just improving the quality of uh, public service delivery. So if you can just uh, free up all these civil servants uh, from the things that are really easy uh, to automatize and you can get them to work in a 20% that's more complicated, then you can do both. Like you can just focus on the ones that are easy, easy, uh, uh, coded and, and applicable by, by machines and get people to work on the really complicated one and at the same time, first one, um, improve the quality of your public policies and second to have uh, people and the, the civil servants that are already working doing the work that is that is most required to them which is actually not doing work that can be done by machines but doing work that requires their intelligence to in order to to to, to improve the quality of uh, uh, people's lives so that is one thing and then there were others as well that i saw that was really uh, interesting one uh, related to companies as well it's like super complicated to know specifically for small companies like how much taxes you have to pay and and even how much you're going to pay someone when you have to hire and so there is this uh, really interesting problem in your friends about uh, small companies don't hire people because they don't know exactly how much taxes or what is the tax wage basically uh, and so that was another application for uh, us, we say now, now uh, Rose Scott, that, that got me thinking we could do better. But the third one, and I think the most important one that I saw was uh, this asymmetry uh, of information while, while debating the budget bill. So uh, as it happens in government in France specifically, government proposes a budget bill. And it is not that much the role of uh, the, the Chamber of Deputies and the Senate to actually propose policy, but rather to discuss it. So this is a very, very uh, a specific uh, French thing. And the way it happened is that all the structural uh, means of actually knowing what the impact of the laws is going to be, or the proposed bills is going to be, relies mostly on government than uh, 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 senators or deputies. So. Uh, for a long time and for 10 years now in France, uh, the senators and deputies are asking for means to actually get to objectify better what the uh, options or how the actual uh, budget bill or different uh, social security bills are created by government. And, and so that's how I, I saw as well at the same time, I, I, I tried to, 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 to get everything together. I said, oh, okay, so basically now uh, Matt has been working on something called Open Fiscal that we can we really have some taxes coded. So why cannot we just try to get all these hypotheses published in code at the same time as the budget bill, as the as social security bill, or even the huge reforms that mobilize a lot of people in France, like uh, retirement. So how much different would it be if with uh, the different proposals, we have ways of actually scrutinize the algorithm and the hypotheses that we actually make? And having them in code. So it was not a thing about uh, getting to get rules at the same level of, of legal code. It was just something based on better uh, policy outcomes. So that's kind of, I think I'm very, very in, in, in sync with uh, Pia here. 
Um, and so that's how I got involved, basically. So we try to learn, we try to teach uh, some people from the Senate to actually work with Open Fisca. It's basically creating code uh, instead of Excel to try to get some results about the different reforms that were being proposed. Uh, there is a senator that actually proposed an amendment uh, to, the, to, the, to the budget bill to say, hey, we should publish the, all the code alongside with the reforms and all the amendments. Um, and at the time, it was not really taken, was taken seriously because it was like a technically complicated, at least for people. And so that got me thinking, so how, how could we get there uh, in terms of uh, something that is more agile and iterative and not that uh, um, uh, top down. And that's how we invented something called Lex Unpacked. Thank you, thank you much again. And so we invented something Lex Unpacked and the thing was uh, we tried to identify like, okay, so before actually getting rules into code in, in more academic, in an academic way, like how we can actually get profit from, from doing it. And, the Lex Unpacked thing was uh, we did, uh, as, we, as we did, as we, as we do user research and we, we discovered that the biggest problem for senators and deputies was to be able to just have a, a, a little more objective uh, uh, information about uh, how uh, different proposals were going to impact their, their citizens. I don't know how you say exactly that in English, but the constituents, yes. Uh, and how much uh, that is going to be fair in terms of uh, redistribution for people. And most importantly, how that's going to impact the budget of government, because there's a responsibility in terms of uh, how, how do you actually propose different decisions, as a diff different amendments in that terms. And so what, what I realized is that we had these, uh, uh, these uh, rules already written that we're able to uh, be used to create such services. And, and, that's, and that's how it started for me in terms of my, of my, of my, of my personal roadmap. Uh, and, and then at some point I said, okay, so we basically should write the rules before writing uh, and voting the, 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 the legislation. But it was, Again, uh, and I come from, and I, and I go now for uh, what were the questions uh, for me at the time and, and, and what the opportunities I think and the challenges are. Uh, the first thing was uh, we were working heavily on something uh, really, really in terms of government as a platform. And so the objective there was breaking the silos. And so we really wanted to get economists and developers and, and policy offices working together into trying to imagine how we can create the rules in, in some in creating basic policies in a more contributive way. Uh, what we what we wanted to do also at the time is uh, to harness the intelligence of civil society uh, because uh, there's also something that, that I actually believe a lot in, in terms of government as a platform is that there is a lot of intelligent people out there already doing better than government and we should just get an alliance with them instead of fighting them. Um, the second one was in terms of all, also was transparency, it, the, the comebacks from the information asymmetry. Uh, we, we know that we can simulate what the impacts of policy going, are going to be before and after what we call exonte and, and, and exposed. Uh, we know that if we publish the codes and the different policies of the rules and of the policies before, we can open them to public consultation. And, and that has not just to be with the code, but in the policy itself. And, and also we can let uh, other people and uh, from civil society to scrutinize the different policies and algorithms and propose uh, amendments as well. So uh, this was uh, and the, 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 second, the second thing that uh, I saw and interest me in terms of the rules of code. And, and lastly, um, for us, uh, was a, a real shift in general, not just on, pub and on public policy making, but in government organizations. So uh, this uh, program that I work on called uh, uh, Beta Group, basically uh, it's, it's a method uh, of creating the digital public services, we call the state startups. And, and the idea was not just to, to create different websites, but 
uh, or just to change the way we write rules. But the thing was to change the very basic organization of the government itself. And, and so as we saw it, rules were not just a paper at the time, but uh, the actual uh, rulemaking has to do with how do you actually deliver public policies. And so that's how the, 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 the whole rules of scope thing came to me in terms of how do we change the fact of uh, rulemaking into something that is more impact driven, more into delivering results that is user centric and all the organization has to be changed in order to achieve those, those, objecti those objectives. And, uh, and, and so we have to do it and with multidisciplinary teams and with different ways of actually thinking about rulemaking and in different ways of actually uh, delivering those, uh, the, all, all the policy and public, and, and public services. Um, yes. Thank you so much, Melka. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Maddie now to, to jump in. Uh, some of the, the comments and uh, discussion around this topic are always around, well, it's a big idea and everyone sort of thinks you've got to have, there's a tendency to think you have to have everything right before you start. Um, this is, well, you've been on a long learning journey with this. Can you talk a little about uh, where people might think to start and, and how that you don't need to have necessarily everything sorted out just to begin? Sure. Um... I think you need to start with the potential impact. Um, as I as I mentioned uh, um, in, in in the introductory remarks, um, I believe we were able to deploy uh, OpenPISCA and, and make it scale and have have these first experiments uh, uh, with with better rules or rules as code. Sorry, in in production was really by having it driven by use cases. Um, I don't believe that you can onboard uh, the entire structure, the entire administration that you are going to need to change solely on the notion that at some point it's going to yield better rules. Because, well, first of all, they have something and most of the time they don't realize how dysfunctional some of the process might be. Um, and they are, all the people and, and institutions involved are already um, in, in, in a in a very strong uh, level of tension. Um, if, if you uh, follow the work of, of legislative drafters, most of the time it's work that takes place overnight um, or the, the, the time constraints are so strong. So you, you cannot ask for these people to stop what they are doing and, and start learning an entire new way to, uh, to draft legislation. So I believe, and, and what we have uh, seen uh, is that you need to find some area, some subset of legislation of the rules um, that have a need for, uh, for rules as code. It might be that, um, that this specific area is uh, undergoing massive changes and that uh, people and institutions involved um, need in any case some way to cope with the amount of changes. It might be um, a specific area where um, there is uh, a whole of government approach uh, aimed at improving service delivery, which might be reframed as making rules more understandable, more actionable by the public but you need to find some carrot. You need to find some shiny toy for, for all these actors to, to work on together. Uh, you're not going to convince them with abstract notions. So really my, 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 my main suggestion is to find an opportunity and start small, prototype, iterate, which once again is not specific to the rules as code approach, but is really one specific case, one implementation of the overall um, most effective way of transforming government. And as we've said, as you've said, um, it is one of the key areas of government that we are trying to change. So we should apply the same recipes we use in other 
in other areas where we want to change the way government operates. Thank you so much, Matty. Um, I'm going to hand to Pia, but uh, just uh, one, one thing I'd like to add in, Pia, is if you could also comment on, I think sometimes we, we need to start with the practical, we need to start with the things that, the small iterative things that can be done now, but it's also, I think, important to emphasise that this is all leading to something. This is part of a, a broader shift and transformation in government and spelling out that if we don't do this, we're going to come up against a big mess later on, and particularly in that, that AI and the machine world that you're talking, you spoke of earlier. But uh, Pia, to you. Um, thank you. I just wanted to build a little bit on, um, on some of what, what Maddie was saying as well. Oops, hold on. Um, and it, it's come up in one of the questions as well around fairness. Um, I, think, um, I, I think that there's a, a misconception that, um, that this will somehow make things less fair uh, because you know, machines will be making decisions which I think ignores two fundamental problems. Um, the pro first problem is that there are a lot of machines making decisions that are unfair today because of lack of traceability between what was implemented and the law. The law's over there in one format. There are many layers of interpretation and then what's implemented may or may not be the law as we have found. Like everyone that's been working in this space have found examples and some of them are quite horrific where the law was implemented wrong <laughs> and created in some cases inequities in some cases benefits um, but um, in any case it is the lack of um, um, full traceability back to law that actually makes the current process um, for a lot of countries anyway um, somewhat unfair so part of the goal of this and part of the one of the nice um, consequences of having uh, an API for and just to be clear again, largely prescriptive based rules or where precedents are clearly defined. Um, this is not about automating judgment or justice or, um, um, uh, or, or that sort of decision making, although there's a whole area there that people can experiment in. But um, by being able to, to have in your business systems to capture at the point in time where a decision is made, here is the law that that refers to is is amazing you, you can actually improve traceability so one of the um the work that we're starting to do in in the team that i've got in in canada and that, that we were doing also in um in new zealand is um uh, before was um using the two use cases of um can a individual a citizen or business or whatever appeal a decision um you know you need to actually be able to capture at a point where a decision is made what is the law it was based on? What is the traceability? What are the data points that were, were included? So having, you know, can a person appeal the law and can you audit the decisions? Uh, sorry, appeal a decision or audit the decisions are two really interesting tests because people that are trying to use AI, you know, and, and sort of say, oh, well, neural, you know, networking, uh, neural programming means that you can't, you can't capture um, the reason, you can't capture the rationale. Just because we've got shiny new tools to play with doesn't take away from the fact we are bound legally, ethically and morally to, um, to have full explainability and access to justice um, for decisions and work that we do in public sectors more than any other sector. So um, it is, um, I, I want to uh, reassure and just, um, you shouldn't have to trust government. When you have trust infrastructure in place, that actually contains and captures those kinds of that kind of information. Um, people shouldn't have to trust it because they should have visibility and transparency to it, and um, and they should have ease of um, um, appealability and ease of auditing of um, uh, so that uh, governments and public sectors are, uh, are as accountable as we should be. That was, I guess, the last comment I wanted to make. Thank you. Well, and Pia, maybe I could just ask you, though, to, to elaborate a little. I mean, one of the things that we, we talk about in this work in the primer is that, uh, you know, part of the, the importance of this is that rules are becoming more and more embedded in our physical world. Uh, as digital becomes dominant, the rules underpinning and the laws underpinning those things actually manifest in how we experience the world. What would you say as, as to that and, and why perhaps this, this work is going to become more and more important? I, 
I think that that sort of really, I mean, I think you sort of articulated it. Um, if we, if we, um, the world is complex now and every rule that is put into place has unintended consequences now. Um, trying to take a point in time, at some point in time, you have to draw a line in the sand and say, this isn't working, we need to do something else. If we had our legislation available as code, or at least a reasonable proportion of it, at least maybe where it relates to service delivery, where it relates to regulation, those are the two areas we've mostly worked in in the teams I've been in, and that's where we've had the most success and um, most opportunity. Um, so being able to draw a line in the sand at some point and say, um, at this point in time, we're going to start actually creating authoritative code uh, for um, you know, this scope of rules for the current regime. And at this point in time, we're going to start doing um, you know, effectively bilingual coding in um, human and machine language. Um, until we actually draw that line in the sand, we are all just continuing to interpret and, um, and maintaining the policy implementation um, chasm. <laughs> um, we are supposed to have a continuum between policy implementation. Right now, there's not a continuum, there's a chasm. And a lot of stuff falls into that chasm and never comes out. Um, the, the lack of line of sight means that policy doesn't know whether the policy intent is being met or not. Um, certainly not fast enough necessarily to know or to be able to iterate implementation on the fly. Implementation half the time doesn't know what the original policy intent was and measure their success on user and performance metrics. So I could have a 100% user satisfaction digital service or, or service in general. I could have the best possible efficiencies and effectiveness measures in terms of the service and uptime and response time and all that kind of stuff. But if the original purpose of this service was to keep people in their homes for longer, to take pressure off the aged care system and to support dignity of life, is it meeting that is, you know, is often not known. Um, so um, what this is really is, is a smaller part, um, is a small part of a broader necessary shift, which is starting to happen globally, a necessary recognition that the policy service continuum is largely broken with a few exceptions that prove the rule. And we need to think collectively, creatively, and uh, quite seriously about how we close that gap because at the rate of change and at the scale and exponential speed of change that we are all facing, COVID is just the start. Um, there, you know, we are going to have rolling pandemics. So how we design for that kind of change and that kind of exponentialism um, is, is critical. We need to see COVID as the huge warning that, um, that we need to transform how we do policy. Uh, otherwise, we simply will not be resilient or effective or responsive. And we can't be a platform upon which people can thrive if we can't even um, catch up with or respond to the change that's happening around us um, in the way that, that the society that we serve needs us to. I hope that makes sense. Thank you. Now, this is obviously a very uh, rich area of discussion, hence why we had to write quite a long report. Um, Malco and Maddie, are there any final comments that you would like to make um, today that you think people venturing on this journey should, should know or keep in mind? Maddie? Yes, I, I don't think we, we really touched on the, on the, the limitations of rules as code and, and how we should not fantasize that we are going to transform all of the rules and all of the um, apparatus of, of, of legislation and, and behavior constraint, uh, constraints um, from government with code. For example, um, I'm, I'm always worried that, that there is a confusion uh, between rules as code, as in transform some subset of the law into code with um, let's have criminal justice given by robots. Um, hopefully, uh, most, uh, most uh, um, people who will read the report will realize this is not at all the case, but there is still this confusion that's looming. So I feel it's important to address it. Um, what we are talking about is, is uh, algorithms. We are not talking, for example, about machine learning based on jurisprudence. Uh, we do not want to uh, teach statistical outcomes to unaccountable um, machine learning systems that would then forever repeat uh, the potential mistakes of the past. What we want with rules as code is 
increased transparency, uh, more understandable uh, rules, and that means that we have um, a sort of a, a objection, um, um, and a link, a very strong link between legislation itself, the rules, and how they are expressed, and the code. The code is here to make the rules understandable to machines, but as we have seen, by doing so, we also tend to make it more understandable for some humans. Not only humans with technical ability to read the code, but also humans who might then be able to exercise the law with test cases. And that is one of the very important aspects of rules as code, is that reading legislation, reading rules, uh, and especially niche ones, can be extremely hard for citizens. And by transforming law into code, making it um, uh, exercisable, we can very easily provide um, ways for citizens to try out how law um, can react or be, um, be enacted in different cases. So we always have to keep in mind that this is not about um, adding more technicity and making it easier for machines to go faster in applying abstract rules. It is all about um, involving the entirety of society um, and, and providing more opportunities for better rules, not, not simply m rules that are more easily applicable by robots. Thank you, Maddie. A really important point. This is about, as we say in the title, about rulemaking for humans and machines. Um, it's a vital part of, of the democratic process if people need to understand and be able to see the rules. Uh, Malco, what, what would you add as a final comment? Yeah, th thank you, Pierre and Mati. This is really, really uh, good points. Uh, I would just like to add uh, the thing that uh, in terms of rules as code, we're always moving forward and backward at the same time. So uh, we're moving, <laughs> now what, what I'm saying is that we're moving forward in terms of, of course, that at some point we would like to have an authoritative source of uh, rules as code. So we can have, for example, APIs, so get uh, all the companies and civil services to, 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 to branch on. It's kind of this uh, uh, government as a platform objective. Um, and also the way to get there, of course, uh, has to be in small steps uh, and trying to find where there are people that had some problems and how we can actually rely on, on rules as code to provide them a solution. So it's, it's, not, it's not the other way around. But we, we also move backwards in the sense that, uh, as, as Pia said, there are already a lot of uh, rules as code or, or policy implementations out there that are not scrutable, that are not auditable. Uh, you have to seize some governments in order to actually open source some code that already uh, are uh, making decisions for people and, and they defend with lawyers. So, I mean, we, we have, it's not just a technical shift, it's actually a mind shift and an organizational shift for government. Uh, and so a lot of the work that we can and we must do for rules as code now is to, is to focus also on the rules that are already coded in opening all those systems in, in open source and trying to get all uh, uh, different uh, public organizations to work uh, on open source to create a, a governance that allow also citizens and other agencies to participate and which actually kind of requires changing the chain of command in the way uh, uh, public organizations are uh, uh, managed uh, today. Um, and, and, and creating ways to audit, audit those algorithms and, and, and allowing for, for citizen scrutiny. And the thing about uh, getting people to actually being able to signal or collaborate, it's a really important one because as we've seen, and that's this experience that we had at least in France, is that no one single civil uh, public agency has all the intelligence to write all the single rules that can be written. And so at some point you require and you rely on all of the government and all of the hackers and researchers and developers out there that uh, can actually have something to say, that know some rule, that can find or spot a bug or, or, or can provide from the, for, for different uh, improvements. And all of that is not automatic, uh, automatic. You have some different platforms that allow to do that in internet like GitHub or, or others. 
but for for this to work it has to be a real change in, in terms of the way of like the organization of government itself and and without that i think uh, the rules as code is nearly impossible so this is kind of the big challenge that i think we have and uh and that's it for me thank you as always technology uh, is an important part but it it's how that integrates with our cultures and our practices that matter. Uh, James, I'd like to pass to you now to just tell people a little bit about what's, what's available to them if they want to get started and, and the resources there. Yeah, thanks, Alex. And um, as you may have seen in the chat, uh, there's been a lot of resources shared, so we will um, try and collate those and put those together. Uh, we've developed a project page on the OPSI website, uh, which will, which is now available. Uh, the primers are now live and a highlights document as well. Um, and on that project page, uh, we will also um, post the link to um, this recording when it's available um, in the next day or so. Um, and we will try and send that out to uh, hopefully by email as well. Uh, the slides will be made available and uh, if you'd like to get in touch um, with us we, we more than welcome that on on this topic um, if we can't uh, i guess help directly in in what you're looking at in terms of rules as code we certainly can um, put you in touch with uh, the whole um, global i guess rules as code community um, a number of um, whom are, uh, whom are here today um, and again, I just, uh, as, a, as a closing um, reflection, I, I just think the conversation was excellent today. And I, and I think uh, it, it really, for me, comes down to uh, the fact that this isn't just a technocratic idea. This is, uh, this is something far more than that. And uh, these big ideas that involve consideration of um, the fundamental roles of government is something that we really need to engage in to ensure that uh, we're ready and, and prepared for, I guess, the future and we're able to um, best serve um, the citizens that require our government support. So, uh, yes, I'll, I'll hand back to us. Thanks, James. And on that note, um, I'm just going to give a quick plug for our, a, an event program that we've been working towards this year, Government After Shock an unconventional event for unconventional times, where we've really been uh, working to help pull together a platform for governments and others to reflect upon the crisis and what it's revealed about the role and expectations of government now and into the future. It's an opportunity for all of us to take stock, to think about, well, what does the world that we're in now in show us? What does it mean for what we do and how we do it? And how might we need to change and what might we need to leave behind? Um, and as part of that, as someone mentioned in the chat, uh, there will be an event specifically on rules as code uh, and, and law as code. So um, uh, we'll include the link to that in, in the summary that we send out. Um, otherwise, I would like to uh, thank everyone for participating today, uh, especially our guests, uh, Janusz Bertok, the de uh, Deputy Director of the Public Governance Directorate here at the OECD, Pia Andrews, um, uh, for all her wise words and bumper sticker slogans that she generates, as she says. Uh, Malko Kuroga and Maddie Schneider um, uh, from the as the Chief Innovation Officer of the Ambassador. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, I hope we uh, provided a good sense of what this concept is and how you can get started. Uh, the, the primer is available at that link. And uh, I think it's really important to emphasize that, as has been said, this is as much about public administration as it is about technology. It's about uh, as much about how we engage with people as it is about how we engage with machines. And there's something that all of us can start digging into in this space. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation and the work on the report. Thank you. Thanks.